Well, all right. Um, here we go. This is going to be fun. Joe Rogan, a stand-up comedian. For more than 20 years, Joe Rogan has sold out theaters internationally with London's Guardian newspaper praising him as one of the most complex and exciting stand-ups working in America today. That is high praise. His fourth-hour-long special, Joe Rogan, Rocky Mountain High, premiered on the, uh, on Comedy Central November 21, 2014, and you may get it as a digital video or audio download. He is host of the Joe Rogan Experience, featuring long-form conversation, God bless him for that, with guests that is one of the most popular podcasts online. Since 2002... He has provided color commentary for the UFC, the Ultimate Fighting Championship. I'll have questions about that on pay-per-view. Spike Television, and now on Fox. So coming up in just um, a moment, somebody I know you're waiting for, Joe Rogan. Joe Rogan, welcome to Midnight in the Desert. Thank you for having me on, sir. It's a huge honor. No, it's my honor. I've been a fan of yours. I guess uh, we spoke briefly before the show, and... Well, I guess we've been fans of each other for a while. Hmm? Yeah, well, when I used to drive home from the comedy store late at night, you kept me company many, many, many a night. I've been a huge, huge fan of your show and you for a long time. So for me, this is uh, just a huge treat. Well, thank you. Um, all right, so you uh, you did a big show, Fear Factor. You did it for a long time. I think there were six seasons of it, right? Yeah. Um, and now you're doing a podcast I was on uh, national radio everywhere. Now I'm doing a podcast. Pretty cool. Uh, well, it's a beautiful time for, for broadcasting in that sense that anybody can put something out online. You don't have to have a network. You don't have to have uh, anything other than an Internet connection and uh, some place that's willing to host it. I mean, it's really incredible times. And because of that, I think we're getting, like, really diverse shows. We're getting all these different people, that, like myself, that probably would have never done an actual radio show who are enjoying the freedom that the Internet provides. I agree, Joe. Where do you think this means broadcasting is going? I mean, there's these giant radio networks, even television. I think uh, AT&T just ate DirecTV, and now you can see all DirecTV on AT&T. Wow. Well, I think the the really big networks, what they're good for is high-budget things like Game of Thrones or something along those lines that requires millions of dollars in special effects. But for something like what you do or something like what I do, all you really need is a, a couple of tech people to run things mm-hmm. and get things online, and that's it. You don't need giant networks. You don't need interference, producers, people that are running things that I'm sure you don't care about, like demographics and all that jazz. Yes, sir. All that unnecessary stuff. Yeah, I mean, I think that it's better. I think it's better this way. I agree. All right. I, I've got to ask a little bit about Fear Factor because I was like a total fan. In fact, uh, here's a question for you. Um, I was used to seeing it every week, and then suddenly there were some weird splits where Fear Factor wouldn't be on for a long time, and then there'd be an episode and it wouldn't be on again for a long time. Do you remember that? I sort of. I don't know what that was about. It was probably just they had saved a few episodes, and yeah, you know, they uh. do weird stuff with ratings. Ratings, are, you know, they're always trying to manipulate things during sweeps, and I, n- I never really understood how that all all that stuff works. What was it like, you know? Um, everybody was going to want me to ask this for you to watch these poor people facing, you know, like Central American uh, biting, scratching, eating, furry, gushy things. Uh, carrying them with their mouth and then drinking a blender full of them or something like that. How was, how, how was that? It was as bizarre for me being there, being the host of it, as it was for anybody to watch it. Ninety percent of the time, I would show up at work and I just, I, I'd be just shaking my head, going, "I can't believe this is a real show." <laughs> it was very, very strange. As a matter of fact, the reason why I was willing to do it in the first place was because I was convinced that it was going to be something that was only on the air for a couple episodes, and then I would have material to make fun of. I uh-huh. just thought it was something completely ridiculous. I'm like, there's no way this is going to stay on television. And then 148 episodes later. Yeah, you know? that's right. Um, which brings me to this. Uh, with those kinds of shows, you kind of have to keep topping yourself a little bit, right? Yeah. Uh, did it get to the point where you wondered if people would live through the next episode? 
Well, it didn't the first time around, but the second time around, we did it again for seven more episodes, I think it was, in 2011, I believe it was. Right. And then I was worried because there were some episodes that we did where they really kept up and yanti further and further, and there was a few accidents where nobody got hurt, not, nothing serious, but it was like, wow, this is this is more risky than we ever did before, and I always felt like we got lucky the first time around, especially... Huh. There was a few stunts, like they, they had to ride bulls, and uh, I'm like, that is just a risk. You're just rolling the dice. Oh, yeah. And anything can happen when you have a bull involved, as we've seen. Um, I don't know if you've paid attention to the running of the bulls. It's the, one of the deadliest years ever. They, Eleven people were killed in the running of the bulls this year. Yeah, I know, but I, I think that's sort of the earth evening things out. These people don't belong running in front of bulls anyway. I'm with you 100%. Kind of, kind of a cleansing. Um, <laughs> all right, so um, now you have this podcast, and oh, I've heard that you do some paranormal occasionally. You do sort of everything, right? Yeah, well, I've done quite a bit of paranormal, and I, I did quite a bit on the – I did a sci-fi show called Joe Rogan Questions Everything. Right. Uh, where I, you know, met with a lot of people that were UFO fanatics and Bigfoot people and a lot of strange stuff. And one, one of the things that I found that I found very unfortunate, because I've been a huge fan of just uh, – I just love the idea of UFOs, even if it's not real. I love the idea of Bigfoot. I love, I love the possibility of uncovering some massive mystery like that, of human beings uncovering something like that. Yeah, of course. But, but what I found doing the show that I didn't like was that – there was a lot of uh, what I was dealing with more than actual facts was psychology. And you, you, you get into the psychology of people that believe in things that don't necessarily make sense, where they're not looking at it objectively. Instead, they're like choosing to only, only look at certain information, or only look at certain data, and don't look at anything that conflicts with that. Yes, I know. Yeah, I know. It's, sure it's, it's a problem. It is a problem in ufology and, and all over the paranormal. But... Still, I'm one of those people who I want to believe there is something more. There has to be something more, I think. And, well, I uh, definitely want to. And if there isn't something more, then I guess we won't care. Yeah. I mean, what, wanting to believe is uh, critical. I mean, it's like, of course. Who wouldn't want a UFO to fly right over the White House lawn and everyone to watch it on television? I think it would be a, a huge, a unique bonding experience for mankind if we really, really were visited. It's like that famous Ronald Reagan speech during the Cold War, sure. how quickly we would abandon our differences with the Soviet Union if we were faced with a threat from another world. And, and we would, too. Oh, immediately. Right, right away, it would put it would snap things into perspective. You know, I think the uh, the idea of this whole entire planet as being one community would really come into focus if we really experienced something from another planet, a life form, a super intelligent life form, especially if we felt threatened by them. Well, we are a warrior-like people, and I speak of Americans when I say that. Um, and I suppose as a world, we're a warrior-like people. So it figures we'd have to have a war to bring us together. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, in a lot of ways, that's unfortunate, but true. All right. Um, I, I, do you do politics on your show at all? Well, I do a little, but, you know, quite honestly, uh, the game is so rigged. It's, it's such a hustle. Well, it, it normally is. And the, and the only thing I want to ask you is your view, your view on Trump. <laughs> <laughs> well, I like people that stir things up. I loved Ross Perot back when he was running for president because there was a guy that had a ton of money and really didn't need the establishment anymore. And I think there's in some ways you get that with Trump and you get you get a guy who's going to be brutally honest about things. But you also get a guy talking about Mexicans being rapists and oh, yeah. a lot of crazy stuff that people like, well, he's he's in many ways like a lot of really wealthy, successful people. He's a buffoon because he's this guy with this tremendous ego because he's accomplished so much. And one of the ways he's accomplished it is by having this sort of bulldog determination and plow through no matter what. And that leads him to think that he can be the king of the world. And that's where he's at right now, pushing forward and trying to become president. And he's ahead in all the polls by yeah, like, a large margin. Right. Like over double, I think, <laughs> the next guy. So, yeah. Oh. It's early. It's an early game. And we all know that sometimes it's not. It's like running a marathon. You know, you see a guy sprint right out the gate running full blast. Sure. Like, well, how long can that guy keep that up? Yeah. Most of the time they can't. 
That's right. All right, let's switch completely subjects because I'm really interested in this one. Okay. You apparently have had experiences. You, did you did you know Terrence McKenna? I didn't know Terrence, but I do know his brother Dennis. I've had his brother Dennis on my show a few times, but I was hugely influenced by uh, Terrence's uh, appearances on your show. In fact, right? Um, there's some MP3s floating around of uh, him live from Hawaii, from the Big Island, on a broadband spectrum radio signal. That's right. Fascinating, fascinating podcast from, or excuse me, radio show from back in the day. And uh, I've listened to it many times. What an amazing man he was. And I, too, have, uh, well, of course, I interviewed Terrence, and then I, I'm going to interview Dennis again. I've, I've done it before. So um, I guess the big question is uh, your experience, if any, with DMT. Uh, I've had quite a few. And, in fact, I have a DMT tattoo on my left arm because of one of them that I had was so profound that I just felt the need to mark it on my body because it was such an insane experience. That profound. Um, okay, can you actually explain that experience? It's very difficult to explain because it's one the, the, the idea of DMT, when, when you hear about it from someone who's never experienced it, or rather when you try to explain it to someone who's never experienced it, it sounds like you're seeing some things that aren't there. Oh, well, you're into hallucinating. You're into escape from reality. When you get into the reality of what the, the drug is, it's a human neurotransmitter that exists in your own body. Your, your lungs make it, your liver makes it, your mm-hmm. brain makes it, right. the pineal gland creates it, and it's the most intense psychedelic drug known to man. And what's even more bizarre, and I'm sure you know this, but maybe some people listening don't, it's in thousands of different plants. It's, it's, it's all over the world. It's in almost every ecosystem ever observed, and they don't know why. They, they're really, it's a very bizarre and mysterious psychedelic drug that is also a massive part of the world that we live in. And when you take it, you experience something that knows everything, or at least appears to. They communicate with you in some sort of strange language. There's a lot of repeated themes. There's, uh, there's uh, telepathic communication. There's some sort of way of expressing to you truth in some undeniable form but with love and beauty and in impossible geometric patterns that are just fractal and floating through the air all around you it's it feels like what it feels like is you in the presence of a higher power it feels like what i would imagine it would be to make contact with some sort of a divine entity and i think that when you look at all these different UFO abduction experiences that people have had uh, mm. that take place in the middle of the night where you're in heavy REM sleep, where many people believe the endogenous dumps of DMT are going on through the brain. Many people believe that it's responsible for dreaming. And I say believe because there's a lot of good work being done right now on this by uh, Dr. Rick Strassman, his Cottonwood Research Foundation. And you can learn a lot more about the technical aspects of it from guys like him and from Dennis McKenna. But it what it feels like when you're there is like you're communicating with God. And that's really what it feels like. All right. For a lot of the audience that doesn't know, um, there, there are other hallucinogens, of course. For example, LSD, which was a very different and long experience, um, and uh, mushrooms and so forth. But DMT is kind of in a different class, isn't it? it, it, it it's rather short. In duration? Yeah, yeah, very, very short. The, when you're smoking it, which is the way most people get it, uh, it lasts about 15 minutes. And uh, it's in it, it's one of the reasons they call it the businessman's high. But it's really odd that they call it that because it's one, the last thing you'd want to do after you do it is do any kind of business. <laughs> Right. But it's uh, extremely transient. Your, your body gets rid of it and brings you back to baseline inside of 15, 20 minutes. Any danger? Uh, I think any time you're dealing with something so mind-bogglingly extraordinary, there's the possibility that people with weak hearts, people that uh, don't have uh, the steadiest nerves or perhaps maybe the, the, they don't have the best grip on reality. I think anybody that has real psychological problems should probably avoid psychedelic drugs until they've reached some form of stability in their life anyway. Have you ever had a flashback? I've never had a flashback to like where I fully went into it, right. but I've gotten like to the door and peeked in, and it's uh, it's disturbing. It's it disturbing is, it is. It's so readily available. It yeah. is, especially at dinner, you know, with several people. 
<laughs> yeah, it just gives you that little nervous thing. Does anybody know what just happened to me? And But uh, really, it seems to be the flashbacks that a lot of people have, they have when they're dreaming. Um, many people who have done it, I've I've uh, only had, uh, like I said, like a peek through the door, but many people who have done DMT have had dreams where they smoke it and then fully immersed into the DMT realm again. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Um, you said you felt like you were in touch with a higher power. Um, I, the high power? I mean, do you, do you think that, um, I don't know, God is a word we throw around, but, uh, you know, is that what you're talking about? Well, it would be pretty arrogant if I assumed it was the higher power because I think being a lower thing like, like humans, I mean, obviously the highest that we know of, but we can conceive of something eventually being more evolved, more grand, bigger than us. And I think whatever this is, it's that. If it's the, uh, is it the higher? Well, it's very possible that this experience is merely the tip of the iceberg, and there's something below that that's even more mind-boggling, even more profound. It doesn't. While you're doing it, it feels so titanically alien that nothing could be any crazier. But I think that could very well just be a perception issue, um, a reference issue, the fact that we don't really have a lot of experiences to compare it to that are that crazy. But it could just be the beginning. And that's one of the things that a lot of people who get heavily into psychedelics, and Terrence uh, talked about this quite a bit, that they always want to see further. They always right. want to go deeper because they always have this feeling that there's something like you take five grams, you want to try seven. You huh. take seven, you want to try ten. And you want to go deeper and deeper into the world of mushrooms or the world of DMT or ayahuasca or any, any of the, the known psychedelics. I think that's one of the things that happens to people that are frequent travelers is they want this experience. They want to, they, they feel like maybe there's more to it that even as crazy and as bizarre and alien and strange and awe-inspiring as it is it may just be the beginning of this infinite spectrum of possibility would you say that your experience with dmt has changed your your day-to-day -day life in any way yeah i think it's changed me i think um i think i think what we are is how we've interpreted uh, how we've interpreted all of, our, all of our experiences, how we've interpreted our, our interactions with people, our time on this planet. When something comes along that just throws a monkey wrench into the gears and shows you something that not only did you never imagine, but feels like you could never have possibly imagined without this experience, that now your point of reference has changed dramatically. Now, instead of having this small spectrum of, of possibilities, you have this possibility that's so far out to the left or to the right that you, you can't see the end of it. And you never thought that was possible until you have that experience. And I think that profoundly changes you as a person. Okay. Because we are really just an accumulation of our experiences, our interpretations of those experiences, and what we've, you know, how we've learned from them and how we apply them to our lives. And the times that I've done DMT, I've always walked out of it feeling like there at least has the potential from this for me to be a better person. Mm -hmm. You said that you heard different languages from I guess, entities or whatever. Did you actually see something, and, and could you detect that it was a human language or non-human? Well, the language seems to be, you, you, you seem to hear it telepathically more than anything. And there's a oh. lot of, like, repeating themes. Like you hear, um, uh, the, there's a lot of people say, you hear, look at this. I've heard that. I've heard it. And I've heard a lot of other people say the same thing. They show you different, insane things. I remember one time I, I did it, I was, I was literally crying because they kept saying, look at this. And they would show me something insanely beautiful. And then it was like, like a, I have little kids. I have a five-year-old and a seven-year-old. And one of the things that my five-year-old says, she'll say things that, that are they're really cute and adorable. Like, I love you a million, five hundred thousand, million, <laughs> five hundred thousand billion, zillion, infinity, times right. a million times, they, right. you know, numbers that aren't real. Well, they, that happened in my DMT experience, the, one of the first ones I ever did. They would sing a little song like, I love you 600 million, 500,000, 500 million times. <laughs> and then it would go, look at this. And then every really? time it would go, look at this, it would show you something infinitely more beautiful than what you just saw. And then it would keep going on and on and on until tears were like rolling down my face. Um, <laughs> I think a lot of that 
it's it's a sound. I mean, you you you're understanding what they're saying. You're understanding words, but I'm not exactly sure you're hearing it more than you're you're hearing it in your mind. And it's one of the reasons why I connect it to the UFO abduction experience because one of the things that you hear from these people that have been that have had these classic UFO abduction scenarios is telepathic communication where there's words in their mind and they're not exactly sure if they're hearing them or if, if they're being transmitted somehow directly to their consciousness. And that, it kind of feels like that when you're doing DMT. Wow. Um, is there any advice that you would give as a big listening audience out there and they're listening going, DMT, hmm, is this something I want to try? Only you can answer that. I really think that it's a, that's a personal thing. And, and I, you know, I've told people they should do it before, but it's probably irresponsible of me. Really, I think everybody's got their own psychological makeup and everybody's got their own, their own path in this life. And if it's something that you're compelled to try, there's a lot of people that believe, and I've heard this from many people that have done it, that DMT finds you. You don't find DMT. You might go looking for it, but really it finds you and decides whether or not you should do it. I, that doesn't necessarily make sense to me and it sounds like an adorable thing to say you know it sounds cute like <laughs> profound in some sort of a strange way is it really but, separate from ayahuasca from anything else is dmt unto itself one thing that's a good question that someone else should probably answer dennis would probably be better at that because i've never done ayahuasca i've only done the the, the condensed version of it what i the difference for folks at home that are listening that don't know Ayahuasca is like a slow-release DMT, and it was created by the indigenous Amazon people because they don't have chemistry labs. They can't synthesize DMT. They can't uh, extract it from these plants the, the way chemical, uh, the way they do it in labs. So what they do is they use the root of one plant and the leaves of another plant. So one plant contains the DMT, and the other contains an MAO inhibitor, a natural MAO inhibitor, and MAO is monoamine oxidase, and what it, that is is something that your gut produces that breaks down DMT when you eat it. That's why if you eat like phalaris grass or something that's rich in DMT, you don't get high from it. The reason being is monoamine oxidase breaks it down inside your body. Well, these in, ingenious people thousands of years ago figured out how to combine these two plants. It's a really complicated process where they brew it up, and what they did is they created a slow-release DMT trip. And it's not uh, from the people, and again, this is, I haven't had this experience, so I'm just relaying from people that have. It's not as intense, not as, like, not as, it, it's the DMT flash that you get when you smoke it. You rarely reach that state, but you have this profound long-term experience that instead of taking 15 minutes, takes several hours. Wow. Um, yeah. All right. Let's move on to the uh, the totality of how do you feel about we're legalizing marijuana now here in my state, Nevada. You know, we've got medical marijuana at last. Uh, other states are completely legalizing it. Where is it going in America eventually with drugs? I mean, our jails are full of people for drug violations of one sort or another. How? What do you think? Well, locking people up for experimenting with their consciousness is criminal. I really think that. And it's very contradictory when you look at all the drugs that are legal, the really intense, powerful drugs that are easy to get. Anybody who knows, if you ever had a back injury, you can get Oxycontin or all sorts of different painkillers like that. It's not hard to get. All you have to do is have a legit reason to have them. I had uh, this uh, guy, Chris Bell, on my podcast who made the documentary Bigger, Stronger, Faster. Right. Uh, it was a steroid documentary, mm -hmm. and uh, he injured himself. Uh, he had a hip surgery and uh, got hooked on Oxycontins. He's got a new prescription out called uh, Prescription Thugs. It's sort of dealing with the prescription drug business. So. It, it's, there's plenty of drugs that perturb our consciousness. We can walk into any liquor store or any grocery store and buy enough booze to kill ourselves. So it's, it's not that anyone's protecting you from anything. What it is is we have sanctioned drugs, and these sanctioned drugs, they, you know, they get a lot of money from them, and then there's a lot of tax revenue that come out of it, and there's also a lot of people that have a vested interest in continuing to keep those drugs legal. All right, hold it right there. We'll be right back. For Dark Matter News, I'm Leo Ashcraft, Pitcher, Oklahoma. It's a ghost town and former city in Ottawa County, Oklahoma. Formerly a major national center of lead and zinc mining at the heart of the Tri-State Mining District. Over a century of unrestricted subsurface excavation dangerously undermined most of Pitcher's town buildings and left giant piles of toxic metal-contaminated mine tailings heaped throughout the area. 
The discovery of the cave-in risks, groundwater contamination, and health effects associated with the chat piles and subsurface shafts, particularly an alarming 1996 study which showed lead poisoning in 34% of the children in Pitcher. This eventually prompted a mandatory evacuation and buyout of the entire township by the state of Oklahoma and the incorporation of the town, along with the similarly contaminated satellite towns of Trees and Cardin. An F-4 tornado, which destroyed or damaged 150 homes in May 2008, accelerated the exodus. The town ceased official operations on September 1, 2009. Google knows what you did last summer. Now it shows it to you on Google Maps. Today, the Google Maps team launched a feature called Your Timeline. That is about where you've already been. It's not a social feature, as you're the only one who sees it. But it's a reminder of how much data Google has on all of us if we leave all of our defaults on. If you Google Photos, your pictures will appear along with the places you've stopped along the way. A Kansas woman said she stepped outside with her dog and noticed something unusual in the sky. The moon and the stars were gone. She said everyone came out of their house and were all pointing at the sky. And what they saw covering the sky was disturbing. The thing was dead silent, they said. Massive, so big, so huge. But the sighting didn't last long, and it took off with the blink of an eye and no noise. She said it wasn't round like a saucer. It was kind of like an arrowhead shape. The entire bottom of it was pitch black until it took off, and then it was multicolored lights at the bottom. As the object moved away, the woman's daughter became terrified. A former state trooper from Washington say that he is currently in contact with several Bigfoot creatures and that he feeds them food regularly. The man who provided a name but chose to remain anonymous said that the encounters had been happening since 2009 in a remote area in the North Cascades. He said sometimes it's five to ten minutes, other times they stay for hours. He says he leaves them apples, carrots, beef jerky, cookies, and candy bars. The man says he was looking for an old mine in the mountains the first time he came across the alleged beings in 2009. After leaving the food out there for him, he says they seem to have started following him and getting closer. He says he's been as close as 20 feet to some of them. He reports that he was so close to them that he was able to catch some of their language on two different occasions. He said it sounded like Native American and an Asian mix. The creatures reportedly stand between 6 and 7 feet tall and probably weigh in at about 500 pounds, females being a little lighter. He describes them as having a human face, some with dark hair, others red or brown, probably about 3 to 4 inches long, adding that the females had small breasts. He claims he's not the only one to have seen the creatures in the area. Numerous people have also purportedly seen them while accompanying the man. The former state trooper says the creatures have never presented a threat to him and that he leaves them alone and he's not interested in hunting them or gathering physical evidence. Florida resident John Bird last year claimed to feed Bigfoot potatoes and plantains on a regular basis. In the spring of 1982, a soldier training at Fort Leonard Wood Army Base in Missouri claimed to have spotted a seven-foot-tall creature with brown hair that resembles the former state trooper's alleged sighting. Portions on the United States side of the range are part of the North Cascades National Park. There were reports revealing the intentions of the U.S. Army to annex part of the region as a helicopter training area, drawing criticism from the Forest Service employees for environmental ethics. I'm Leo Ashcraft. This has been Dark Matter News. Hey, Joe, um, what's your opinion of French dressing? French dressing? French dressing. Okay. Ranch, ranch dressing. Oh, ranch dressing. Yeah, ranch oh. dressing. There's something oh, there. Yeah, that's my friend Joey Diaz has uh, a, a he's got a quote that you can't really say on this radio show. Oh, okay. But it's either blue cheese with wings <laughs> or then something explicit. But that's uh, Joey Diaz. If you don't know who he is, he's the funniest person, I believe, the funniest person that's ever lived. When you do a, a, a podcast show, uh, do you need somebody to bounce off of? I mean, do you do it absolutely by yourself, or do you have somebody? No, no, I ne almost never do it by myself. I've done a few yeah. in the early days by myself, but uh, I either do them uh, with uh, just a bunch of different guests, or I do it with my occasional co-host, uh, Brian Redband. I did one of them today with him, who's a longtime friend of mine, and we just, so we do one every week or so, we just go over crazy stories in, in the internet. 
You, know, you really need somebody. If you're going to do comedy, you really need somebody there, don't you? Yeah, but they're not always comedy. See, my podcast is very confusing. Like, so it's in the comedy section, but sometimes I'm talking to professors. Uh, tomorrow, I'm talking to Jeff Novitsky, who is the guy who busted Lance Armstrong. Wow! And uh, he's gonna. We're going to talk all about the different performance enhancing drugs they use on the Tour de France and how they avoid getting caught and what's going on right now in professional sports where they test and how they get around these things. He's a guy that was hired by the UFC recently to clean up the sport. Uh, the UFC has uh, quite a, an image issue when it comes to performance-enhancing drugs. Mixed martial arts in general does. There's just so much on the line for these guys that a lot of them are willing to uh, take chances with illegal substances. And uh, we're going to discuss that tomorrow. So is, is, the UFC, is, is the UFC real? Oh, it's 100% real, yeah. 100% real, huh? 100%. Whereas yeah. regular wrestling... Well, regular. Have you ever watched the UFC? Um, I a couple of times, yeah. Well, you're up in Pahrump, right? You're, yeah, that's you're right. up in. That's... If you ever want to come down, there's a big event that's going on September 4th. I would love to have you come down and uh, introduce you to the world of the UFC. And if you saw it live, you would not for a second think that there's anything fake going on. It well, is... you know what some of the rep of, of regular wrestling was. I mean, so. Well, of course. Regular wrestling is is entertainment. It's 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 a choreographed entertainment show, no different than a play. And a lot of people love it. It's not my cup of tea, but a lot of people really enjoy it because it's fun, it's crazy, and it's wild. The UFC is very different. It's it's a much more primal experience, and it, it is absolutely one hundred percent non scripted and real. So, kind of like Fear Factor. <laughs> in some, <laughs> some ways, Fear I Factor guess. was. Scripted in sense of we knew what the stunts would be, but as far as the reactions, yes, exactly. All right, um, all right. <laughs> staying or, or extending from DMT, I understand that you have been. This really interests me, uh, Joe. You experiment with sensory deprivation chambers. True. Yes, I have one in my house. Um, I have one in my basement, and um, uh, I have been a big fan of them. I first got one in 2002. I got my first one, and um, I had heard about them years before from really originally from that Altered States movie. Right. That right. was where I was first introduced to them, and then uh, I got into John Lilly's books. I read uh, some of his stuff on them, and then I realized that that Altered States movie was actually based, a, a lot of it was based on him. Uh, the crazy. If you don't know who Lilly is, John Lilly was uh, uh, the guy who invented the sensory deprivation tank, and uh, he was a pioneer in interspecies communication. He would he would do all these uh, experiments on dolphins and trying to communicate with dolphins. And one of the things he used to do is he used to take LSD and set up a sensory deprivation tank near dolphins and try to communicate with them. Wow. Yeah, he was out there. All right. So <laughs> describe to me the sensory tank. Uh, experience. It, it, is it warm water? Is it cool? yes? Yes. Okay. Yes. The water is the same temperature as the surface of your skin, which is about ninety three and a half degrees. There's uh, in my tank. I have a tank from the Float Lab in Venice, which is uh, there's a guy named Crash who runs the Float Lab. Who really, when the tanks were very unpopular, when no one knew about them, when they, I mean, right now their experience is tremendous renaissance, and I'm very happy that I'm a part of that. And Crash is a part of that too because he's the guy who really innovated and took tanks to this incredible uh, level of sophistication that they have now. And he's the, the one who designed the one that I have in my basement. And it has um, 1,000 pounds of Epsom salts in this water. And the water is about a foot deep. And you just get in the tank, and because there's so much salt, you float. And because the water is the same temperature as your skin, right. once you sit in it for a minute and you relax and stop moving, you can't really differentiate between where the water is and where the air is. It all feels like one thing. It feels like you're flying. And you have this weird experience, this weird, weird sensation of flying through space. Have you not done it? No, I haven't done it. Oh, uh, ever God, since Altered States, I've wanted to try there. it. Wanted to try oh, it. please. Please come to California as my guest. I'll bring you to the Float Lab. We'll introduce you to Crash because he's a trip in and of himself. And uh, get you in one of these tanks. It's amazing. And it's very relaxing, too. It's very therapeutic for your muscles. It's great for your body because it gives you this feeling of weightlessness. And it relieves all the tension in your muscles. And it's also a great way for your body to absorb magnesium because the Epsom salts contain magnesium. And it's absorbed through the skin. So it's actually really good for you as well as being relaxing and in certain situations, you can experience some pretty intense psychedelic experiences. Ah, uh, that's what I was going to ask. It, it, yeah. it, so altered states and maybe even more altered states. 
<laughs> yeah, well, some people like to uh, – I, I, I personally am a big fan of consuming cannabis and then getting in there, oh. especially uh, eating it. Um, but uh, some people like to do it with uh, all kinds of different stuff, mushrooms. Uh, Lily was a big fan of ketamine. He used to take <laughs> ketamine and then climb into the tank. That's another hard hit, boy. Ketamine. Yeah, that's uh, that's a little beyond my reach. <laughs> <laughs> that one's uh, – that's a spooky one. But – the idea being is that when the mind has no internal or it was no external information coming at it. It creates. Just, yes, it creates. And it also, because it's no longer processing all the data like your balance and social cues and looking at people and just touching and feeling things and gauging your distance, because you can't, can't see anything, you can't hear anything, you don't feel anything, your body's free and your mind has an incredible amount of resources that it usually doesn't have. The way I always describe it to people is that if you and I were having a conversation, but next to us there was a guy working a jackhammer, it would be very hard to keep the conversation, to very hard to focus. Absolutely. Well, sure. But life is kind of a jackhammer. Life is constantly giving you information just from the f sensation of the ground under your feet, the sensation of the clothes on your body. Especially uh, if you're in the business we are, it's constant. It is constant, and it's hard to, to just let it all go. And I, for me personally, my, the way my body and mind work, I find the tank to be almost irreplaceable. It's one of the most important things that I've ever experienced as far as like just being able to unwind and think about stuff and have a perspective. And I've, I've come to so many conclusions while I've been in there, made so many decisions that I might not have made while I was in there, and it just sort of guides me in a weird way. So good decisions. Oh, yeah. I don't think I've ever made a bad decision in the tank, as weird as that sounds. <laughs> I've made a lot of them in the shower. So, I... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, me, me too, like singing. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, a couple of calls. Um, Skype, you're on with Joe Rogan. Hi. Hi, how are you? Just fine. Go ahead. I, I wanted to say, uh, I don't know if Joe remembers me. I was actually a contestant on uh, Fear Factor. Whoa. I, I believe what it was season, season two. What season were you on? Do you know? Uh, season two. Season two. Do you remember what you had to do? Of course you probably do. Oh, yeah. I had to, I believe it was an elk's penis. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. So we were in the park? Were you, yeah. Uh, yeah, that was um, Griffith Park. Is that what it was? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, okay. What's your name, man? Oh, my name's Dwight. Okay, Dwight. What's going on, dude? Oh, not a lot, man. I catch you all the time when you're on UFC, and uh, uh, I especially loved when you were on Chappelle's show and you did the uh, parody of Fear Factor. That's too bad. Um, that's all right. I took care of it. I have a button for that. Um, Kansas. I, just, I couldn't remember his name. I was like, hmm, that's <laughs> yeah, I strange. He's not that good, but. Yeah. Kansas City, you're on with Joe. Hi. Hello. Oh, hey, is that me? Yes, you. Oh, hey, I just wanted to ask Joe. I know this is not a sports show, but he was so excited when Rousey won. What was that like to be there when that happened? Oh, when Ronda Rousey won in Brazil a couple of weeks ago. It was incredible. I, I felt like yeah. it, was, it was a historical event as much as it was uh, a fight. Uh, and, you know, a lot of people say, well, you know, it was, it was a mismatch and the, the girl wasn't as good as she was. And I think that's all very fair and true. But I think that what she represents right now is something wholly unique, this incredibly dominant female combat sports athlete. And uh, I just think what, what she's been able to accomplish in just a short amount of time as far as raising the public's perception, I felt like I was there for history. I felt like I think like there's guys that tell their kids, hey, I was there when Muhammad Ali, when Muhammad Ali beat Sonny Liston. And it kind of felt like that to me, like that kind of thing. Like you were there when something historical happened. Oh, it was so incredible, yeah. I wonder if she, what she's going to do next. <laughs> uh, she's going to keep fighting, I'm sure, for a little while. But I, I imagine with all the lucrative movie offers that she's getting, when she feels like she's accomplished enough, she'll move on and just do whatever she wants to do. Joe, have you, uh, have you seen a, a new TV show, actually not so new, three, four seasons now, uh, Naked and Afraid? Yes. Yeah, I have seen it. That thing is wild. Uh, I wonder how far so-called reality TV is going to go. I mean, you I take somebody completely much... naked, a man and woman, throw them in the middle of Borneo, yeah. and something bad's going to happen. 
Well, it's certainly dangerous. I, mean, I don't know how much they monitor them. I mean, it's hard when it's naked and afraid doesn't mean naked, afraid, and alone. So I don't know how many people are there watching them while this goes on and what kind of a, you know, a medical crew they have standing by. You know, I, I'm not sure. So. Well, they, they do. They've got a producer and then they've got a little medical crew. But, yeah, dangerous. Oh, definitely. But bizarre, too. You know, like, why, why are we doing this? Like, why are we exposing people to, to this? Like, what is, what is it about these silly shows that makes us uh, so excited? And also, it's, it's, it's a great wake-up call for people when you realize how vulnerable you actually are out alone in the woods and how difficult it is to survive. Yeah, sure, with no shoes. I mean, that. imagine, no shoes, and you're walking on these. Oh, God, it's awful. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. So, you know, I mean, how much further can reality TV go? It's a good question. It's a good question. I mean, when we were on Fear Fact, I used to joke around and say we're about three seasons away from The Running Man. But (laughs) we might have already passed that with something like Naked and Afraid. I mean, we might we might someday see something perhaps like it from another country where, you know, we we're seeing some sort of deadliest game sort of a thing where people are hunting people. That's entirely possible. I mean, well, they've they made have, movies about it. Yeah. I mean, they have these uh, team fighting uh, sports in Russia now where they'll have like five people fight five people right. inside a cage right. it's like, and they're two on one. And it's crazy. It's horrible to watch. And it, but it's, what they're doing is they're taking things like people tend to do to the most extreme place. Sure. West Virginia, you're on with Joe. Hi. Yeah. Uh, I thought that uh, the expression Joe used about uh, DMT was really interesting, especially... Uh, what expression? Uh, the uh, how it finds you. Oh. Because uh, I was following the dead in uh, 2003, and uh, I was a part of that scene going coast to coast. And uh, some guy offered me something that looked like sesame seeds, but they were like dark and amber, amberish color. Uh, it was uh, it was quite an experience. But yeah. the well, really that's, that's one thing you never do is give somebody a drug that they're uninformed about. That's about the worst thing. I, I can't even imagine uh, receiving... Well, see, there was... Uh, or the whole tour, there was talk about DMT going around, that somebody was divvying it out allegedly. But well, this uh, isn't, the thing that I was... Yeah, but... I'm sorry, isn't this after Jerry Garcia was dead? Didn't he die in, like, the 90s? Yeah. Yeah, but... So yeah, they kept touring? Uh, like, uh, yeah, because if you think about it, Joe, if you go back to the discography, there's, they, there's the other two guys sung a lot, too, uh, just as much as Jerry. But the real point that I wanted to make tonight, to uh, really open uh, your mind up, a little bit more, uh, you know, talking about the UFO community and stuff like that, is, uh, you know, I believe that mind-altering substances is a gateway, you know, for us not to only be able to see yeah. interdimensional beings and extraterrestrials, but to communicate. Uh, but those substances are strong tools used in mind control and ritual abuse. And and I'll take my uh, the comments off there. Thank you, guys. And I'm right. to be talking to you both together. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, so, Joe, what, what, what do you think? Well, I think there's definitely been some experiments for um, using psychedelic substances for mind control. That's that's a fact. Um, and there's a great documentary called The Net that is actually about um, the Unabomber, Ted Kaczynski, and Ted Kaczynski being a part of the Harvard LSD studies. And it, there was a lot of studies that were done uh, by the military that are well documented, uh, where they were experimenting with LSD on soldiers, try to see what the effects were, right. and how they could use them to manipulate people's minds and, and frame and get them to do things that they wanted them to do. You know, the whole idea about Manchurian candidates, those things, That's those are all real experiments for sure. They definitely have tried to do that before. Okay, real Which quickly. Whether or not they've been successful. Right. Don, real quickly, you're on with Joe. Hi. Hey, how's it going? Uh, nice to see you back, Art. Thank you. Uh, glad to glad to be here. Um, Joe, I have a UFC question for you, if, uh, okay. if you could answer that. Sure. Um, you, a guy asked earlier about Ronda Rousey, and he got uh-huh. me wondering, uh, you really, you said it was really special being there, seeing her do that. Out of yeah. all the other fighters and fighters, you know, fights you've seen, uh, which ones felt the most supernatural, like you were seeing something special? Other than other than her, what, what are the top guys that just you felt like you were seeing something epic? Well, I never got to see Fedor fight in his prime. I would have loved to see that, but I did get to see Anderson fight in his prime, and Anderson 
uh, Anderson Silva, who I think is the greatest of all time. I, I think he he moved like a guy in a video game. He would do things that didn't seem real, like things that were from a movie. He, in, in his prime, when he was at the top, he was just spectacular. Like, you, he would have what uh, Lorenzo Fertitta, one of the owners of the UFC, uh, always refers to as the holy S moment, like that every great UFC has at least one holy S moment. Right. And right. Anderson really defined that to me. He was, he was just so incredible when he was at his best. All right. Not a lot of time. Pismo yes. Beach, you're on with Joe. Hi. I, I, oh, my God. Oh, my God. Am I on, on you, you, the air? You are. With my two heroes. I can't believe it. Okay. I have I have two questions for you. One of them is serious and one of them is silly. Uh, the silly one is, what kind of motorcycles do you guys ride? The real question that I'm calling about, and I understand, Joe, if you don't want to talk about it, but I'm still going to ask. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, news radio was like genius it was the best thing that ever happened to tv and i still love it and um when when phil died i my question is was there any animosity on the set towards andy dick i just said dick on the radio it's his name um yeah but um was there any of that because i i know the rumors i'm sure you do uh better than any of us do that's my question Oh, you mean the rumors that he got Phil's wife the drugs and that's what led her to I don't blame anybody for that other than his wife. And even his own wife was, was on a cocktail of SSRIs and cocaine, and she was probably psychotic at the time. It was a terrible, terrible event. To your first question, I don't ride motorcycles. so uh, I don't either. I, 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 I used to. Uh, I learned about gravel and motorcycles. That, that cured me. I came close. I took the motorcycle safety courses. I was thinking about buying one. And then two of my friends uh, who had bikes, one got hit by a car and one fell on his bike and hurt themselves real bad. And I was like, yeah, I think, I think I'm going to sit this one out. <laughs> yeah, I don't blame you a bit. Um, so what does the future hold for you? Uh, more what I'm doing. I really, really enjoy doing the podcast. I really enjoy doing stand-up comedy. Uh, and I really enjoy working for the UFC. I'm very fortunate that I have these things that I enjoy very much as far as, like, you know, my career. Uh, I've just been uh, real lucky to be able to do a lot of fun stuff, and it's led me to be able to talk to you, which is one of the highlights. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly how I feel about what we do. It's fun. I love it. Joe Rogan. Man, thank you. And I, you know you, what? Sir. I may it's take you up. Honor. I may take you up on that uh, that offer about the tank. Please do the tank and the UFC anytime you want. It's an open invitation. You got. It.